I had just read Mackenzie's An Engine, Not a Camera, and I was totally inspired. And I wanted to take on the question of mortgage securitization. And I had originally thought I would be able to rely on a secondary literature for the history and do a more contemporary project. But very early on, it became clear that a lot of the history hadn't been written. And then when I started learning about the history, it became clear that it was a really fascinating history involving the government. So it evolved into this question of then why is the government so, um, so actively involved in this technology? And as I dug, I realized if I wanted to get it right, I needed to understand the longer history. Absolutely believe they do. In part, it's the practices we live by. If we take the New Deal, for example, and this idea of kind of European style planning is failing and we're setting up a welfare state but it's not um, as kind of big and robust as a lot of people would like and we have this massive expansion of credit allocation and credit provision we're in a world where we're imagining that what we owe other people is not care and welfare income support a social safety net but access to credit markets um, so I do think that it's a, a fundamentally moral question about what we owe uh, to each other. Part of my desire to write the book was always to try to be able to use the tools of sociology to demystify finance. Um, part of the way financial power works is this idea that only if you're an expert can you understand, a certain kind of expert can you understand it and make claims on it. And of course, like, that's a lot of what a social power is rests, rests on. So having um, socio kind of uh, helping sociologists um, and uh, other non you know, and, and non-financial experts know that they can actually understand these things and speak to them was a really important part. And so writing really in, in a more accessible way about some of these things was an important explicitly important part of uh, that project for me. Mm -hmm. So I had a few lines of inspiration. One was I've always admired Arlie Hochschild. I would sometimes joke, what would Arlie do? Like she's this incredible, brilliant ability to come up with the phrase and the metaphor, you know, the second shift, the time bind that helps you really understand what, she, you know, the, the argument. And so I would often think about how she named things and try to think about um, how I might name things. So the big fight that I see right now when it comes to credit programs and credit allocations is on one hand, um, a leaning into private equity in a way that I think is going to be completely disastrous <laughs> and have um, and, and absolutely magnify inequalities. So that's on kind of one side, and that's what I would be more afraid of. Is could happen. Um, could really, it's already happening and could absolutely accelerate and gain even more power at this moment. And on the other hand, we see this push for Green New Deal. And um, this kind of this political imagination of fighting for massive infrastructure, huge job programs, um, large investments in green technologies um, that are that would use that would of course like involve flows of credit and flows of government support, um, but do it in a way that's explicitly designed to reduce inequality. Hopefully, be better than the previous New Deal, and not which was just designed around reproducing racial inequality. Um, you know, we're in that kind of a moment where people are fighting it out, and you know, I don't know exactly what will happen, but my personal hope is we get to something more like the Green New Deal than a kind of doubling down on a reliance on um, on renterism, finance, and private equity.